Good morning, everyone. This is El Simone from America's Test Kitchen, founder of She Chef. Welcome to Table Stakes. Today, I have with me a good friend and colleague, Grover Smith. Um, Grover Smith is the dad of Indie Chefs Week, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And if you have not, yeah, hopefully you'll have time. Um, it's a multi-city tour of dinners featuring the best independent chefs in North America. Each year, Indie Chef Week, Chefs Week visits different markets across the U.S. for four days of bonding and three nights of dinner for guests. For the chefs, it's a weekend spent collaborating on dishes, learning about each market's unique food economy and the people that make it special, and talking about pertinent issues facing the hospitality industry. We celebrate the people that make community through food possible. Indie Chefs Week is a community of like-minded, incredibly talented chefs running restaurants in all facets of the hospitality industry that focus on advocating for each other, promoting sustainable business practices, and improving the quality of life for everyone in their field, which is very necessary. Now over 500 members strong, I'm probably 473, um, the Indie Chefs Week community extends to every major minor metro in the U.S. Due to the recent pandemic, the chefs in our community have changed their focus to advocacy for their businesses, employees, and small businesses in general while pivoting to providing meals for those in need, frontline responders, and out-of-work hospitality professionals. Grover grew up in Texas and graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a degree in economics. After a decade in real estate development, Grover changed careers and started working in restaurants in Austin. Grover became the general manager of Foreign and Domestic, Austin's first nose-to-tail restaurant. After relocating to Houston, Grover was the general manager of Bernadine's and the Pass and Provisions. Like many of his peers, his life in the hospitality was not conducive to his health and well-being, and he burned out in just under six years, which is not uncommon. Grover lives in Houston, Texas with his wife, Jackie, his daughter, Sloan, and their three rescue cats. I love these names. Truman, <laughs> Harper, and David Foster Wallace. Yes. I love that. I love that. Well, well, that's all my wife. <laughs> with the voracious reader. I love it. I love Sloan's name, too. That's adorable. Welcome, Grover. Thank you so much. Thank you so much well, for um, coming to Table Stakes. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have some kind of uh, interaction with a human that's not my daughter or wife uh, for once. And I love them, but uh, I know every you know, day is a different thing. That's a new that's a new <laughs> formula for most of us. I get that. I have a non T-shirt on, so I'm excited about that. Too. <laughs> I have on lipstick. I did my hair today. Um, well, what we're, table stakes is really about is giving our industry leaders a platform to talk about a little bit about what is happening in the culinary industry to give those of us who are, who are not in the industry a way to support, to get information, um, and also to talk about what the shift could potentially look like in the future for the industry. So first, tell me what initiatives you are leading out with Chefs Indie Week, um, and maybe individually and maybe collective. What are some other orgs that you might be partnering with at this time? Well, I mean, we found ourselves in a position, I think, like so many people that... Um... You know, we we suddenly had a lot of time on our hands. Um, you know, I am somewhat uh, lucky in that, you know, I don't have uh, a lot of overhead. I'm not operating something that's in an actual physical space. So I don't have rent and those things. I do have employees. Um, and so, you know, the first thing we did is we uh, reached out to people that were going to be hosts for this year, which uh, we had. I was going to do more events this year than I did in the prior two. And so mm -hmm. I had a pretty long list of cities we were visiting. It was going to be a pretty hectic year. And uh, we kind of saw the tea leaves in this and I'd say late February. I'm trying to remember what the date was, but uh, our first event coming up, we did one in D.C. early February. And the next one was going to be in Richmond, Virginia, um, April, I think two weeks ago, April 2nd or something like that is when it was starting. I can't even tell you now. Um, and so we kind of noticed that this was possi possibly going to be an issue and uh, started kind of unwinding things and seeing if we could delay and postpone some of the events because it seemed like it was not going to be the smart move to not only, you know, do an event where potentially we'd be putting people at risk in a small space, but also, you know, adding that added pressure to the hosts that would be, you know, having us into their into their markets. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we started kind of unwinding in the beginning and then... Um, 
you know, I just started reaching out to a lot of people through one of my other employees, Jackie, just to check on, see how they were doing and trying to figure out what was happening in different markets. And obviously, you know, we have a pretty good contingency of chefs that are based in Seattle. And that's kind of where this thing started and kind of started seeing it happening there. Um, and then New York and all those other places. And I uh, thought that our best way to help in the short term was to be a resource. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I do have the benefit of because I talk to so many people so often, I have such a large network of chefs and restaurateurs that participate in this event. And then sure. also, you know, auxiliary businesses that are related. Um, you know, I do have the benefit of, of being able to kind of bring in a lot of information and disseminate it for others. And so the first thing we did is we started um you know, reaching out and seeing how people were doing, were they pivoting in to take out or to go, were they shutting down their operations, what were their plans for furloughing, those kinds of things, especially around the uh, the required shutdowns that a lot of cities put in place pretty early. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, just as a result of us doing a lot of events in DC and having a rather large network of people that participate in this, I do have some connections in Congress um, that we've been discussing some other initiatives that were going on way before the pandemic started. Um, some stuff that we were going to put into practice maybe next year or the year after. Um, and just by virtue of those relationships, I was able to kind of get inside to what was going on specifically in the beginning with the house and the bills that they were putting together. I can't remember what the name of the, um, the bill that the house had written. And so, um, I was able to get a lot of early versions of the things that they were looking at and we quickly got that together, you know, put it into an easy to, um, kind of digest format, Mm -hmm. uh, circulate it to a lot of the people that participate to see if we could get feedback on some of the initiatives that they were talking about, specifically the stuff that had to do with unemployment and um, potentially grants or loans like the PPP program that ultimately passed. Um, And then we kind of used that to get kind of a survey together, provided that information to the Ways and Means Committee and the Small Business Administration Committee um, in Congress. And coincidentally, in our (laughs) events in DC in February, all the staffers for those um, those two committees were actually at some of the dinners wow. and so um, which kind of was a random connection um, and so we're able to get kind of some feedback to them which I'm hoping was somewhat um, useful to them as they you know cra- drafted the different legislation that was coming together mm-hmm. um, and then yeah so we kind of got with those people put together a letter sent that out and then from there as the third stimulus passed the PPP program and all that started happening um, we got a lot of early drafts on that process and so we had some of the workflows that came through early in the SOPs for applications and those types of things and the different requirements that were going to happen for that and um, kind of disseminated that and got it out and um, you know so they could start the different chefs and owners can make decisions on what the best plan of action was moving forward right. um, and hopefully that was a, a positive resource for them um, and then since then, we've just been trying to act as an aggregator for information. And so, um, you know, like I applied for the PPP personally for our business so I could keep our people employed. And so I had early co- copies of the applications. We got that stuff out, um, got out a lot of, you know, did a lot of answer uh, question and answer sessions with ind- uh, individuals to kind of see if it was the right move for them. Um, I tried to get involved with some of the other initiatives that are going through some of the other groups, like the Independent Restaurant Council, I think is one of them and a few others and see how we could help there. Um, and yeah, just doing that and checking in on people, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've tried to make an effort to check on, you know, 10 to 15 people a week as much as possible, just with phone calls and texts just to see yeah. how they're doing. And, um, now we're kind of in a holding pattern. I'm trying to continue aggregating information for people and sharing it and answering any questions that we can when it comes up for them. But, um, you know, I don't know what this looks like on the other side of this, like no one else does obviously. Yeah. And, uh, just trying to make a decision on, you know, what does our event look like after this? Um, how can we be more of a, a resource for people moving forward? Um, and how do we formalize some of the things we've been doing informally with kind of the relationship building and advocacy for each other? And so that's been our focus right now. We have some other initiatives we're kind of working on that are a little early, but um, that's that's about it. And then hopefully uh, when this is over, um, you know, in the summer or fall, we'll be able to get back to the schedule. And, you know, I think that it's going to create an opportunity for us to maybe um, kind of turn this, you know, my goal long-term had been to make Candy Chefs Week a nonprofit, um, because I do think there's a lot of positive things we could do. And, uh, it's never really been a, a profit seeking motive for me. Yeah. Um, and so trying to figure out how do we kind of take some of the things we've discussed and some of our discussions with the chefs in each of the stops, um, and formalize those, formalize those and make them into, you know, kind of a, a plan for action, um, in order to make some changes moving forward. 
Um, and so that's kind of in the short term what we've been working on. Um, and then outside of that, I've just uh, been growing my hair long and uh, uh, <laughs> it looks great. Play with, it. Play, play with my daughter quite a bit and uh, and hanging out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the short term stuff that we've been going on. OK, um, well, it, it seems that um, having some staffers present at your event really played to your advantage. How um, challenging has it been to like get the information though? Like, or, do you, do you feel like it's been coming in in a constant flow, or is it kind of like you have to you have a thought and then you um, seek the answer and then you know how's that been working? It kind of depended. I mean, I you know I was able to get a lot of back and forth with some of the staffers and some of the members of Congress in the House specifically. I don't really know anybody in the Senate, mm-hmm. um, and unfortunately, the senators that represent our area where I live um, aren't particularly people that I'd want to uh, associate with, but. Um, I, you know, I think it was, it was a good give and take during the process of them creating the, the legislation and getting feedback from them and then providing feedback as well. Um, I, I haven't really been leaning into that yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they're in a bit of an impasse in Congress right now because the house is, um, you know, wanting to do a bigger expansion for funding for hospitals and states and, and counties and cities. Um, and then also adding and continuing to, to kind of, uh, bulk up the unemployment insurance stuff that they have set up for people that are losing their jobs so quickly. Um, yeah. And I think the Senate is trying to primarily just push through additional funding for the SBA program. Um, and so right now I'm kind of just hanging back and we're working on some other stuff uh, kind of moving forward for, for Indie Chefs Week. And then hopefully at some point in the next few days, they will break that impasse. And, you know, I think that what I've been told is we're looking at probably a couple of more, st- a couple of additional stimulus bills. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not really sure what they look like or how they're going to look. And I think that I don't know that Congress does either because I don't think anybody knows how long this is going to go. Right. Um, Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, tell us a little bit about um, how Indie Week has um, impacted chef relationships. Like, do you feel like your organization has brought chefs closer so much so that now they are really like, they, they feel they have a network to kind of tap into immediately? Yeah, I mean, when I started doing this years ago, um, you know, the initial intent was really just to get a bunch of talented folks together from different markets that maybe wouldn't have an opportunity to meet otherwise. And, you know, it was always about the bonding and then also kind of sharing of best practices and, you know, sharing of technique and, um, you know, business operations and knowledge and stuff like that. It was never really uh, uh, like a set thing that that was the actual focus it just kind of happened as a result and you know over the last two or three years what i started to notice was um well actually i got called out uh there's a chef named gregory gorday um out of portland and uh, i had made an unfortunate post on instagram promoting an event that he was hosting that had a bottle of alcohol in it and somebody was holding the bottle of pie and he got upset with me because he's sober and i can understand and he was he was upset about you know, the fact that he was being um, associated with that. And I didn't think about the impact of what I was posting. I was posting it because the person holding the bottle was like, you know, excited. Um, And he kind of called me to the carpet. And this was about three years ago, saying that I had an opportunity when you're getting all these folks together to really, you know, try to push the industry forward and really move this sort of relationship building and advocacy forward into a more formal thing. And so um, I know, uh, you went, you did the Boston event, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, they kind of run together. I've done so many. Um, you know, we did the talk in Boston. Uh, so I started what I started doing as a result, and thanks to Gregory, is that we started doing a sit down discussion with the chefs where we kind of have a discussion around typically um, health and wellness and mental health and sobriety. And the one with Gregory specifically was more about sobriety and substance abuse. But um, it's really meant to be more of a situation to force. I mean, you know how chefs are, and I think most people do, that they're, you know, a fiercely independent spirit. Typically, they want to be self-starters and um, self-reliant. Yeah. And as a result, I think that we all tend to put, you know, these these kind of uh, walls up around us. And, um, I mean, put me in a room with a bunch of chefs I've never met and get one chef to tell me he's struggling, and uh, <laughs> I'll be shocked. Yeah, they're all sure. they're all busy all the time, and they all have $75 PPAs, and, you know, they, they have all the staff they need. But... Um, you know, to really get them to talk about things that maybe they don't typically discuss and uh, by getting people to share and kind of let their guard down and discuss the issues that's facing them um, in these groups of 24, which is typically how many chefs participate in each event, um, it really does kind of get the discussion flowing and it forces them to kind of maybe take a, um, 
an internal look at themselves and what they're dealing with uh, and to share with the group. Um, and as a result of doing that, I think that they're much more likely to be honest with each other. And then that cr- uh, provides just automatically an opportunity for them to to advocate. I keep saying advocacy and advocate, but that's really what it's about, mm-hmm. to advocate for each other and share information. And if somebody's struggling with a specific issue, um, I always say the thing that I've gone with lately is that, you know, if somebody's struggling with a very niche issue at their restaurant, um, just by virtue of the group of 500 plus people and the different types of operation, and it's a huge spectrum of different types of restaurants from the, you know, highest and fine dining uh, prefix menus down to, you know, a sandwich shop. And, yeah. you know, just by virtue of that many people and that many different, you know, the breadth of experience across that group of, of individuals, um, you know, it almost is like internally, communally, we have this kind of playbook that people can lean on and share with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's been the goal is that, you know, creating those bonds and then, you know, the events themselves aren't really about the food. Um, when they get there, it's more about the experience for everyone to make sure that they, you know, they get an opportunity to get outside of not only their restaurants, but off that one cutting board that they focus on every day to really look at things from, from the outside and, yeah. you know, kind of take a look at their progress and their, and their ability to take care of themselves and take care of their staff and, and their communities um, uh, against others, you know, and it's sure. not meant to be a competition. It's more, you know, how did Joe Smith figure this out, you Mm -hmm. know, or what's the secret to their success or the secret to their happiness and that kind of thing. And so um, I do think that it has, um, it has really uh, helped a lot in those, that relationship building. Um, You know, we have these text threads, which you're on one, I think a lot of them are on WhatsApp, but they're among the groups. And one of the things that makes me the happiest and the most annoyed is waking up to like three or 400 messages across, you know, six (laughs) to eight different text threads. And sometimes it's just the most inane, a lot of times it's pictures of dogs or babies or something, but like just, you know, seeing that, you know, that day-to-day check-in and communication is nice. Um, And that's something that moving forward, we're trying to improve somehow. I don't know what the medium is going to be, but I do want to make those more of an active kind of give and take back and forth. And I do want to bring everyone, you know, all the different disparate groups from the different cities that have participated in this into a larger group. And there are some things that we're working towards with that, that I'd love to do that just haven't been a possibility yet. Like, you know, a large reunion or kind of a conference for everyone to get together. That's, you know, an opportunity for all the different groups to meet because I'd like to formalize those relationships and formalize that, that information flow. Um, But we are a small uh, little organization, so it's hard, you know, to get a lot of those things off the ground, but I'm working towards it. Um, and if there's anything that this pandemic has provided, it's a lot of time <laughs> to uh, yeah. to work on things that we've all procrastinated on. Um, although sometimes I think my house probably takes priority, at least if I want to keep my wife happy. And since we're in a small house together, that's probably the best choice. Well, you know, it's also about the priorities, you know, <laughs> you, it, it's probably best to have a happy wife if you have to be it, in the house with them for months at a time. Right. A happy, yes. happy um, mate is very important. Um, awesome. Well, I will have to say, um, my favorite part of Indie Week was definitely the self-care component, you know, and also I'm not, I'm no longer a restaurant chef. So, um, it was nice to be in that atmosphere. It was really great to meet the chefs. I'm still, I was still relatively new to Boston when Indie Week went down. So, um, it, that was actually the, t- the moment that created the full community for me. It was, it was so great. I, I can't even now, like, I don't have another um, occurrence in my time in Boston that really compares to to what Indie Week did for me, and um, and I loved it, and I appreciate that, and I hope uh, I know you will. You're very creative, brilliant mind. I'm sure you'll find ways to translate Indie Week into what the new industry will need. And since we're speaking of new industry, tell me, yes. this is something I ask every guest. We know that the industry will look different because the world is going to look different. If you could implement one new thing to the new industry to come, what would that be? Uh, there's a lot of things that I think need to change. Yeah. Um, before I give the answer, I would say, and I don't remember who, I can't attribute this to someone specifically. Um, there's a couple of things that I'd always heard about food, especially in the last couple of years, that I think rings very true, and especially now, is that the industry, industry has been broken for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, a long time. And I mean, you could argue it's been broken for decades. Um, and the second thing is, is that food is expensive. Okay. And in order to impact the sort of change that I think is going to be necessary on a macro level and long term for sustainability of restaurants to where we don't end up in a situation where we're all buying food at a fast casual restaurant uh, with robot sauteing vegetables and dumping them in a bowl, um, is that 
and this is hard to say with an economy that's as difficult as now, but everyone needs to raise prices. Um, I don't think that, I think that the number one thing that everyone needs to work, and you see this the last couple of years, a lot of people have made an effort, um, but it's been like kind of like the finger in the dam, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, is that, is educating guests on the true cost of food right. and um, how those decisions and those convenience decisions every day impact the well-being of so many people mm -hmm. um you know you've seen the stats everybody's gone crazy on social media the last month with the different things with lobbying congress about 16 million people um employed in restaurants um because our economy has gone towards a gig economy and has gone towards the service industry specifically yes. um because it's harder and harder to find you know good jobs um, and we tend to be an industry that brings in a kind of a catch-all of all types from all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my biggest thing is, is that I don't understand how people, you know, can subsist on the wages they earn in restaurants. I yeah. mean, my, my first year in a restaurant, <laughs> I made, you know, I took a job in a restaurant after a fairly successful career because I wanted to learn and I was going through a lot of struggles with kind of a divorce and some other stuff, and which is a very typical story, I think. And my first year in a restaurant as, as a kind of, de facto GM, I made $29,000, you know, wow. and, um, and that was after being successful the decade prior. And I could afford to do that because I had money saved from, you know, another career, but it's like, that's not sustainable life. Yeah, no. And, you know, the number of hours I worked in that job. Um, and so one of my biggest gripes in general is that you see all these people out here talking about, you know, community and taking care of their staff and all that. And there are people that do do that work and do take care of their people. Um, but it's about, you know, charging enough, educating guests on who they should support um, and, you know, making enough margin on the food, not so that the restaurateurs or chefs can become wealthy, right. but so that they have money in the bank so that they can, you know, weather these types of storms. Yeah. And the reality is, is that, you know, the costs have gone up across the board, rents have gone up, taxes have gone up as a result of that and real estate um, uh, increases in value. Uh, everything is cost more now, and yet food costs have maintained or food retail costs have maintained the same. Yeah. Um, and I look, I'm part of the problem. I have a really good friend who owns a bunch of restaurants here in town who are delicious. He's pretty well known. He has a James Beard, um, and I give him a hard time all the time about how his food's expensive and I can't eat there. Um, and it's a joke between two friends. Um, but the truth is, is he's charging what he should charge. Yeah. You know, and as a result of like being so used to these quick and fast and easy and inexpensive options that we can, you know, dine on that maybe aren't sourcing from the best places that aren't, um, you know, buying the right products that aren't paying their people a living wage. Um, people have lost their, their kind of rudder and understanding what food should cost. And so I think if we can raise prices across the board, um, which I know is a big ask, um, I think that a lot of the other issues below um, can be rectified. Um, talking about how we pay people, what they get paid, what they live on. Um, I think there's a lot of people working really hard to move towards different models um, to figure out how to do that, whether it's a B Corp um, that's like, you know, or it's a it's a uh, co-op owned type restaurant mm -hmm. or, you know, changing the model to where there's not servers, they're not doing a tipped wage, everybody kind of runs food, those types of things. Yeah. Um, because the reality is, is that, you know, we need a higher minimum wage. Uh, we do. And half the people that I'm friends with you know, their restaurants would not survive if the minimum wage was $15. Yeah. And how crazy is that? You know, I mean, it's it's insane. And maybe, <laughs> this is kind of a bad joke, but maybe as a result of people having to make their own bread and cook all this time, they'll start understanding how big of a pain in the butt it is to actually cook and make food. Right, the value, right? Understand the value. That is the truth. I thought, I thought about that just yesterday. Like, I wonder how these people, because they are griping about it. These regular yes. non-cook people are like, oh, all I those have to dishes. cook all the meals, <laughs> all the dishes. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think, that, I think that raising prices is something that's really important. And I think that... Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. A lot of the stuff that's a problem in food are more systemic issues that are more of a thing that's a result of our country having issues mm -hmm. and wage stagnation and that type of stuff. Sure. And, um, it'd be nice if these 16 million employees at all these restaurants would decide to vote this November. Um, what were there? There were yeah. 120 million people that voted in the last presidential election. You add 16 million to those roles. I mean, that's a pretty significant chunk of people. Um, that's true. And so that's something that we're kind of looking at trying to figure out a way to do that uh, to kind of help with that kind of thing and um but yeah uh you know it i don't know i i'm hoping that there will be more to this on the tail end of this more change than just you know getting the doors back just bell open. outs yeah i agree 
I definitely agree. You know, and um, I think that, you know, there's going to be a requirement that some of the people at the top that are the bigger names that have a certain model that they operate on, um, you know, they're going to have to make tough decisions. You know, if we mm -hmm. want to have a healthier industry as a whole, they need to make, you know, tough decisions on how they operate, you know, and yeah. I'm not going to say anything specific or give a specific person or whoever, but there's a lot of people that have certain operations that are very successful, but, you know, they maintain those on, you know, almost predatory labor practices, mm. you know, and like, I think a lot of that needs to, to go away. Yeah. Um, all of it, you know, <laughs> all of it needs to go away. Um, yes. And yeah. it's, you know, it seems like an overwhelming task, but, uh, you know, if there's any opportunity to do it, I would say it's now. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Grover. I really appreciate you coming on and um, talking about uh, the industry and, and what you're doing to help make sure that we pivot, which is the word of the week, um, you know, pivot in a way that will potentially be helpful for us. Um, if there's ever a thing that you need, you know, can always reach out to Shisha. We're always here for you. Um, and yeah, thank you for the information. Thank you for your work and, uh, and your time and your commitment. And thanks for coming to Table Stakes. I appreciate you being here. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's really good to see you. It's been a while. Um, I do say I am going to put up uh, on our website at some point, hopefully very soon, uh, by the time this airs, I hope that it'll be up. We're going to put up resources in some of the markets we visited, Okay. Um, some different things that you can support. Um, there's a lot of folks that are doing great things. Tracy Chang and your market in Boston you know, helped start that off their plate, uh, off their plate.org, which is a really amazing program that is uh, feeding first line responders and medical professionals yeah. um, through, I think they're working with World Central Kitchen. That's a really great one. Eric Bruner Yang in DC started Power of 10 initiative. That's basically a setup that every $10 you donate provides a meal. It brings people just like what Tracy's doing. It's bringing in kind of our most um, vulnerable, like uh, our undocumented workers and people that can't get unemployment insurance is bringing them back into work um, and then also doing something positive and providing food for people that don't have it the lee initiative is something really great going on in texas are doing uh, southern smoke is providing a lot of money for people um, that lost their jobs and then you know outside of that just you know when you make a decision when you buy food uh, don't do it out of convenience um, don't order food through DoorDash or Uber Eats or Caviar if you can avoid it. Order directly from the restaurant. Those services are predatory and take a big chunk out of their mm -hmm. of their um, profitability. And just support the people that deserve your support. Um, there's a lot of people that do things the right way and buy the right products and support the right um, farms and different purveyors. And you know your decision to buy from the right place can impact somebody's life. And so you know don't just do the easy thing. Do the right thing. So. That's awesome. That's a great place in. Before we go, tell us where we can find you, um, your organization, okay, of course. give me all your socials. And if there's a place so, for donating, tell us that also. I will, uh, I'll post some resources based on market on IndieChefsWeek.com. That's I-N-D-I-E, Chefs, C-H-E-F-S, Week, W-E-E-K.com. Um, our Instagram is Indie Chefs Community, same spelling. Uh, Facebook is Indie Chefs Community as well. Um, and everything will be posted there. We'll put resources there. Sign up for our newsletter. We will provide those resources as well as they come available. And then um, pay attention to some of these groups like, uh, you know, independent restaurants and those groups and, you know, lobby Congress because uh, there's a lot of work um, and it needs to be shared between our government and our individuals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, you can find all those resources there. So Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming to Table Stakes, Grover. We'll talk to you soon. All right. You too. Thank right. you, Al. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Table Stakes. If you have questions that you'd like for us to answer in future episodes, please leave them in the comments below. If you like these conversations, be sure to subscribe. Stay safe and be well.